Hello, and our guest is Mr. Noel Gallagher, and thank you, sir, for taking the time. A pleasure. Since this program is called The Meaning of Life, I'm going to start with a small miracle which happened in May of this year, when Manchester City, in injury time, slapped one in <laughs> and gained the Premiership over a crowd called Manchester United. Mm. And I want you to tell me, what did that mean to a young fella or young fellas from Burnage in Manchester? It means everything. Everything. Supporting that team for, since I was five or six or 40 years, I haven't seen them do anything, really. It was just breathtaking, the most breathtaking five minutes of football I've ever seen. Amazing. And on a scale of, to do with marriage and sex and having a child and a number one on the charts and everything else, how does it compare? Up there with that? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And my wife understands that. I wouldn't give up my kids and my family for City winning the league, but I'd, g I'd give up a few number ones, that's for sure. <laughs> Would you? Yeah, well, I've had nine. I'd give up four of those. <laughs> four of them weren't the best. <laughs> OK, take me back to uh, Burnage and the household you lived in, Peggy and Thomas. Where in Ireland were they from? My mum is from a place called Charlestown in uh, County Mayo. My dad is from a little place called Duleek in County Meath. I was born in uh, an area of Manchester called Longsight uh, in a house, as I remember, was on the top of uh, a sloping little alleyway with cobbled, proper cobblestones. And uh, it was a two up, two down outside toilet. Uh, working class, grim northern reality, yeah. Was it a very Irishy, Irishy house? Yes, yeah, there was <laughs> shillelaghs everywhere. But we always spent our summer holidays and any school holidays in uh, County Mayo. Uh, Irish nights in St Kent's, Charlton Irish Club, that kind oh, of... Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. St Kent's, yeah. How do you know about that? I did my stint in oh, Manchester as well, you know. Oh, yeah, St Kent's. You've forgotten I used to see. play for their football team, I think. And w was there Irish music going on in the house? And... Oh, yeah, my dad, was a my dad was a DJ. He was um, a, oh. co a country and he'd play all the Irish social clubs, a country and western DJ. Uh, speaking about your father, it, it has been written much about his alcoholism and his violence and mother doing a skip in the end and, and all of that. You seem to play that down as if it was sort of average for the area and, and the time. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't think he was an alcoholic. He just doesn't, I just think he was a bit of a rubbish husband. But I've got to say, all my friends who are my age, all their all their families are split up. So it was kind of par for the course. The 70s was a tough time in Manchester. Not only for working class people, but for Irish people, you know, with the troubles that were being brought over there and stuff like that. And it was a tough time. You know, there wasn't a lot of work and there wasn't a lot of money. But I don't, I don't look back on any of that time with any regret or sadness. It kind of makes you what you are. It, it didn't mean that you were an unhappy child. I discovered music and... There was a guitar in our house for some reason. No one's ever quite got to the bottom of why that was there. Once I picked that up, that was my escape from everything. No matter what was going on at home or what was going on at school or anything like that, I had that. And, I, and still to this day, I can sit and pick up a guitar and I can be gone for hours. I can be just anywhere I want to be, just playing. You don't see your father? No. It must have been bad then that you may have no contact with him or him with you or... Well, no, I seen him after, after my mum and dad split up. We still seen him. Only well, lived about 200 yards up the road. My mum never said anything like, you can't see him or anything like, we've seen him. We still... He still had his own firm of laying concrete floors and we still did a bit of work with him. But then very soon after that, we, you know, we kind of became men. And then you go off and do your own thing. It's not, um... It's not shocking for families to become estranged when, particularly family of boys, when they all get them start doing their own thing. Did you and Paul have a stammer? I did. I think Paul, yeah. I think Paul did. We used to go to speech therapy. And you got over the stammer? Eventually. Eventually. OK, uh, tell me about um, religion in your house. Now, your mother and father must have been traditional Irish yep. Catholics. Yep. My yep. mum would take us to church every Sunday until I'd say we were teenagers and then and then we just stopped going. I think we were maybe the only Irish family, if I remember correctly. Maybe not. I remember my English friends would be like, 
what are you going to church for? you would be like, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea why I'm going to church. But you just went kind of ritually. Yeah, because my, my, my mum went and that, and that was the thing and to do, you know. Yeah. And did she stop suddenly or was it a slow burnout or, or what? I'm not sure, but now she goes. How do you know? Because she tells me. You know, she tells me she's been to Mass and stuff like that. She's praying for you and for the rest of the family <laughs> and everybody else. And yeah, for one, one would hope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you stopped going when she stopped going? Yeah. And that was a relief. Thank God that's over. Well, not a relief. I mean, I don't... I, don't, I haven't got anything against... My wife and her mother and father, they, they go to church and, and sing the hymns with great enthusiasm and stuff like that. I kind of envy people that have that with religion, that they can insert it into their lives and it guides them through whatever path it is. That I genuinely wish I had something like that. I'm not like... My, my, my soul or whatever it is is not like that. My, my path is different, you know. And, and uh, my wife will undoubtedly, you know, um, bring the boys up in a certain way and, I guess, I wouldn't be against that. Come back to school. You managed to pull a good trick in my book that you were mitching from school in a school where your mother was the dinner lady. Now, that's a, a, a fairly neat accomplishment, if I may say so. Yeah, well, it's one of my greatest achievements, I have to say. Eventually, one of the teachers, I think, said... They'd asked my mum... Well, you know, had she murdered me and stuck me in a cupboard or something because they hadn't seen me for months. And my mum was like, well, I've seen him every day. Wait a minute, are you saying you went in every day so that she yeah. would see you at lunchtime? Yeah, yeah, I went, in to, I went in to have my dinner every day. It was a bit of an art to get in and then get out in a 45-minute a period without being seen by any of the teachers you were having lessons with that next afternoon or you were supposed to have had lessons with that morning. OK, you were done for, for mitching and you were given the probation for nicking stuff off the corner shop and you were getting in with a, a bad lot and uh, all of those things. Not what Peggy would have had in mind for you whatsoever. So no wonder she was extremely angry about mm. it. Well, yeah, I mean, all parents, you know, they're like, they want the... If they see... I guess she kind of seen... that me and we were the two brothers. We're not bad lads. And i got to say, you've got to come back from where we come from. We come from quite a large council estate in South Manchester. And we were all lads, do you know what I mean? And there was no... My dad was working away or we never really seen him as a father figure, you know. So you were kind of out there in, well, in the Wild West almost and it was all going on, you know, crime and, and drugs and all sorts of things. And... You know, I'm just glad I got through the other side and found something in music that met, that took me in a different direction. Right. Now, I remember you distinctly telling me on The Late Late Show that somewhere around there, as you say, you found a guitar and you started to figure out how to get a C chord and a G yeah. and an F and a D seventh and a, a, yeah. a B flat and so on. A and you spent hours teaching yourself yeah. to do this. Yeah. Oh, to the point where my mum thought I was... Like, weird, you know, because I, I would never go out. I, would ne I, was, I became very quickly obsessed with it, and music in general. And the first song I learned to play was House of the Rising Sun. And really, when I kind of mastered playing four chords in a row, that was it, I was off. There was no stopping me then. People say to me, so can you read music? And you say, no, and people find it fascinating that you can't. But I don't know anybody that can. I don't know anybody that could write musical notes out and then play it. Do you think if you knew how to do that, it might ruin you? Yeah, absolutely. I think the more, you know, the more you learn, the less you know, you know. That's the great thing about punk rock. You know, I was just, just very young when punk rock came out in the late 70s, and that was the ethos, do it for yourself. Then when I began to get confident playing the guitar, then there was like... Then you really understand how great the Beatles' songwriting is. You know, and then you learn to play those songs and you think, wow, they're so simple, but it's the melodies they were coming up with on top of that and the chord changes. Uh, and then that quickly became an obsession that still goes on till today. Having been your hero when you, when you now mix with, um, with Paul, Sir Paul, mm. do, you, do you find that awkward in any way? Or, no, he's no? just a reg... The one thing about him is he's an absolute gentleman. He's dead easy to talk to. He knows who he is. He has a bit of fun with that side of it, you know. 
And um, he's great. I bumped into him shopping, you know, one afternoon in Selfridges in London. And uh, some kids, we were in the men's department at Selfridges. And they're like, hey, all right. And uh, some Spanish tourists just I went to walk past and were kind of, kind of got the cameras out. And they said, can I get a picture? And he said, oh, I'm just, if you don't mind, I'm just having a chat with my mate. And I was like, oh, it's me. <laughs> oh, I mean, all the, all the people that you meet who you would consider icons like Neil Young and Paul McCartney and, you know, Weller and all that, there's no attitude with them because they've got nothing to prove. They know who they are. OK, now, when you arrived on the scene with the Big Band and Oasis and, and a lot of noise, you were 27-ish, which is kind of yeah. advanced for a, a budding rock and roll star. That's when everyone starts dying in, in the musical annals, is at 27. That's, 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 they're, they're done and finished. Yeah, I was just revving up by then. When you did come on the scene, you weren't behind the door telling people how good you were and how great <laughs> you were going to be, and uh, you were fairly cocky about the whole thing, were you not? It wasn't the time for wallflowers, you know? We were out to inspire a generation. At the time, we said we, we never had a message for the youth, but really what it was, it was just like, you can, if we can do it, we can do it. We're nobodies. We're a bunch of nobodies from a council estate. But if we can do it, you can do it. All our crew was just all our mates from Manchester. And we treated tours then, as we did right up to the end, till really, an, an extended stag do, you know. Some people run drugs and... <laughs> a lot of drinking. A lot of drinking. Which brings me neatly to drugs. Mm -hmm. Is it absolutely essential that rock and rollers need <laughs> drugs? Does it absolutely have to? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> OK. Not really, no. It's a funny thing. It's a personal thing. You know, evidently, you don't need them. I was doing all that stuff before I was even in a band. So it wasn't like I'd arrived in London, got the fur coat and the guitar and the shades, and someone handed me a big bag of drugs and said, off you go. I was doing that anyway. So when you become a rock star and you have money and a big house, you know, you tend to stay in and you get bored. But there came a point for me in 1998 I went to bed one night thinking, this is the greatest thing ever. I am living the dream. I'm like the new Keith Richards. And I woke up the next morning and I thought, this is boring. I hate all these people. I went out. But a night out in London and just looked around the people I was with and I thought, do I... I don't like you. I don't like you. I don't like your missus. I've never liked you. I don't even know what I'm doing with all these people. I'm not doing it anymore. And I've never done it since. Was it easy to stop? No, because trying to kick illegal drugs leads you to prescription drugs. And they're worse, because you can get those, and you're not breaking the law. And people, doctors, are quite willing. They'll sell you anything, if you've got the money. And when you were on all that stuff, did it improve your creativity or your musicianship? Or... Not in the slightest. No, not in the slightest? Not in the slightest. Why do they always think it, it does and it will? We were doing the... I've got to say, we were doing the wrong drugs. We were doing the one that's historically known to destroy any creativity. Uh, there are psychedelic drugs that evidently helps, you know... Sergeant Peppers wasn't made on drinking tea, was it? But everything that we ever did when we were in the studio, out of it, in, late at night, thinking, this is, this is better than the Beatles. This is better than the Beatles. <laughs> Wait till you hear this. You get up the next day and listen to it when you were <laughs> straight and you go like that. Oh, that, that's diabolical. That is diabolical. And you'd have to quickly wipe the tapes and <laughs> pretend it never happened. <laughs> it, it, the high that you get from whatever it is you're on, does it equal the high that you get from going on stage in no. No. Slane or, or Main Road or Croke Park or whatever? There's nothing... And I've done it all, and you've got to trust me on this. There's nothing in the world that when you walk out on a stage before you've even played a note, you've only got to put your arms out like that. And that's it. Game over. Can't beat that. Are we talking to you at a good time in your life? You have Sarah and you have Sonny and Donovan and it looks like you have a marital 
harmony and, and a nice family. You're a father of three. Yeah. All of that. Is this a good time for we you? mustn't forget the girl, an ace. Yes, an ace. Me. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you talked to me at the best time. Yeah, the best time. Best time? Yeah. Why? Because... It was my first wedding anniversary uh, about a week ago. Although we've been together for, like, 12, 12 years. And um, my wife is still my best friend in the world. I still love her dearly. Uh, we've reached a point now where we're not trying for any more children. We've done all that. And who has the responsibility in your house of teaching whatever religious faith they may be getting taught? Well, I guess the kids will do it at school. So it's the teacher's responsibility. And then, I guess, if they're inquisit inquisitive about it in the home, I guess it's probably best if they speak to Sarah first, you know? But we've not reached that stage yet. With the boys, anyway. But with, with the 12-year-old... My daughter believes in the right things. She adores. I remember once, uh, she freaked out when there was a... I went to... I went to flush a spider down the sink. This is, she freaked out. She was like, to kill a living thing and all that. It kind of took me back a little bit. But they believe in all, as long as they believe in all the right things, and being overtly religious or non-religious doesn't really... Whatever they believe in is fine. I'd rather them come to their own conclusions than me say one thing or another to them. Because nobody taught me anything. I learned it all for myself, you know. But if they ask, of course, you've got to give them your advice, you know. But it's only advice. You can't, you can't force an opinion on, on anybody. By the way, going back to all the trauma between you and Liam and it went on and on and on, did, did Peggy get involved? Mm, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, well, no, actually not. She never takes sides. But, but she tried to sort it out, presumably. Well, it, this Christmas just gone, she said, Court, I've told him to call you and I'm telling you to call him. So it's about time you spoke. And? And, uh, and we exchange texts on Christmas Day and stuff like that. Liam doesn't have a phone because he's always losing them. So you've got to, you've got to text his missus's phone. And we were never a Christmas Day kind of family anyway. Do you miss him? Uh, no, I don't. No, I'm not that kind of person, to be quite honest. I'm not really. I'm not wistful and I don't. I'm not nostalgic. And, I, you know, if I hear Oasis songs on the radio. I don't, like, think, oh, God, wouldn't that be great? Evidently, it would be great. But, you know, I'm always one for just moving onwards. As we speak, you're going on Croke Park tonight. Do you feel nervous about tonight? Do you feel... I've never felt nervous. i felt... In Oasis, I always used to feel a little bit anxious because you never quite knew what Liam was going to do. He could walk on stage and walk straight past the mic and just think, I'm not into it tonight, and just, you know, for whatever reason. Um, the tension must have been... Colossal. Yeah, but that's what made it what it was, and people knew that. But when I go on at festivals or at my shows, the people are there to see me, and there's only one person here today who's an expert at being me, and that's me. So I can't fail. I can sing, I can play, my band are great, I write songs that they all love. That's it. I never think this is just another gig. You know, it's like people have paid, people have paid money to see it. You better be good. You're never afraid of making a mistake playing oh, or yeah, yeah, forgetting not, the yeah. words or... I mean, I do forget the words sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, a quick la da will get you through that. Luckily for me, I write songs that people like to sing. So, so, so they're too busy singing anyway, you know. Right. But, um... <laughs> Now, with the advent of YouTube and all that, you can get found out. You'll, people will say, have you seen that thing on YouTube of you forgetting the words that don't look back in anger? And you'll be like, I thought I got away with that. For instance, we had a new kitchen put in, in our house. And I was just playing a song one night I played a million times before, and I just found myself drifting off. And as I was kind of thinking, I hope they've not put the dishwasher in a stupid place. I hope they've moved the sink from under the window. Cos I... And then the next thing was like, I was supposed to be playing a guitar solo and I wasn't. And the rest of my band were falling around laughing and I'd, I'd completely forgotten where I was. But you find yourself drifting off sometimes. If only they knew. <laughs> well, yeah. 
come back now to the last few questions. Um, what about what about God? Would you describe yourself as believing in God or not at the moment? Again, it's a complicated thing because you, I believe in the power of love and humanity and real things. If you're asking me, do I see the hand of God at work in the world? I'd have to say no, for the simple reason that if if God as a real thing exists, with all the things over the last decade that have been terrorism and wars are fought in his name or in its name, they've all got different names for their gods, but seemingly it's the same thing. For all the people that have died, the innocent people that have died, all around the world, terrorism, in the name of God, wouldn't you think now would be the right time for some kind of global sign? <clears throat> I live in the here and now, and I, and I go back to what I said at the beginning. I wish I believed in, in that, you know what I mean? And I know people that believe in it strongly, and I envy them, in a way. For a fellow who doesn't believe in God, however, I know. Said, said, I he, know. said he, carry, I do write about it a lot. <laughs> carry us all. Gas panic, the Hindu time, little by little, dig out your soul. For no. a fellow who doesn't believe in God, you certainly carry on a fair bit of Well, it's a great imagery. I mean, God, you know, God... I wrote... There's a line in one of the songs off my latest record, and it's a song that I wrote about my wife, and it says, you're the only God I'll ever need. If I do believe in God, I believe it's here, somewhere, in everybody. And when I mention God and angels and all that seemingly biblical stuff in songs. My wife is an angel to me and a real one because she appeared out of the smoke in a nightclub when I was at my lowest and I've never looked back since then. And to me, she is an angel. But she's not a heavenly body, she's real, I can touch her, do you know what I mean? And I do regularly and it's great And <laughs> for me. Not for her. <laughs> and, uh, and God is in me, I think. And God is in her, and God certainly is in my children, you know. I believe in love more than anything else in the world. And if love is divine, great. But I believe that humans generate love, you know what I mean? The meaning of life for me is watching your kids grow up and watching them go from in loads of different stages, you know, and growing with your wife is the meaning of life, I think, you know, and just the day-to-day, -day, the trip of life. You know, some people live their life, they worry about the destination. Where is it going to be? What is, you know, they worry about where they're going. I enjoy the trip. You get where, where, wherever you're going is where you'll end up. Don't worry about that. Enjoy the scenery on the way. What do you think Jesus was? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Jesus, if it's to be believed, was maybe the first rock star. He had his band, 12 of them, and he had followers, and... I guess he pre... Uh, uh, the, the words of Jesus if they are to be believed, really is just the preaching of right and wrong, you know, and all the things that you should feel if you're a civilised human being, do you know what I mean? But there's a lot of stuff in the Bible, and I was taught it at school, that is just, you know, it's all people flying out of clouds and stuff like that. No time for that. I don't see it, I'm afraid, I wish, I wish I did. Do you think there is something after you die? I don't know, I mean, evident... But do you think or hope or wish or...? It would be great... to think... that you would... that I would see my gran... again, somewhere. But, you know, I live now, in the here and now. I can't allow myself... to believe that everything's going to be all right in the afterlife, because it may and it might not be. I make it all right now, today and tomorrow. Not even yesterday, just today and tomorrow. Suppose, Noel, it is all true. Mm. 
When you get there to the pearly gates and he, stroke she, is standing in front of you, what will you say? So you've heard Don't Look Back in Anger, right? And they'd say, of course. And I'd say, well, look, it's me. Let us in. I can play a tune. <laughs> I robbed some stuff. I took a lot of drugs. But I'm all right. I can write a song. Let us in. <laughs> I can't play the harp, though. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.